and welcome everyone to today's Synergist webinar, Autotoxicants, Identifying a Missing Link in Hearing Loss. I'm Kay Bechtold, Managing Editor of the Synergist, the magazine of AIHA. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and especially SKC for sponsoring this webinar. Today's speaker is Lucinette Alvarado, the Corporate CIH and Technical Services Manager for SKC Inc. Lucinette has worked as an industrial hygienist for 15 years and currently serves on the AIHA Board of Directors. And now I'll turn the presentation over to Lucinette. Hello, everybody. I hope you're doing very well here. Let me share my screen. There you go. All right, so thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Um, today, we will talk about a topic that has gotten some attention over the past years. Um, these are a group of chemicals that are considered ototoxicants. So we have information about them, what they mean, and what substances have that designation. Um, this presentation will describe what, what exactly are ototoxicants, where they come from, interactions with noise, and that, you know, identifying that missing link and then how to handle these in the workplace. Okay, so I'm gonna um, shut up my video because um, I don't want to see myself, but let's, let's get started here. If not, I mean, you can see myself, it's okay. <laughs> All right, so let's get started. So let's put things into um, a scenario here. I like I like to put things in scenarios. So you evaluated an area uh, for noise. Everything went well. The data was beautiful since they were like below the occupational exposure limits or OELs. Then you made the report, discuss it with the management and the employees that were um, involved with the uh, you know the survey, and everything is good. Later, you get a phone call uh, from the medical department stating that during the last audiometric test, the employees were identified with um, hearing loss. So in your head, you're like, what is happening? Um, the noise levels were low and I don't understand what is going on. So, well, um, that issue may not be noise actually. Um, it may be other agents that is causing this problem. So um, before we go into the subject, I just want to review with you some biology 101. So this will help to understand how autotoxicants affects the body. So here we have um, the main areas of the ear. So we have the outer ear, and the outer ear includes that oracle, which is that composed of the uh, that thin plate of like, yellow elastic cartilage, and then the ear canal, which is where the sound waves, you know, moves and runs in through the middle ear. Now we have the middle ear. So the middle ear includes um, some areas. Um, so the first one is the hammer. Um, it's also called the malleus, and the anvil, which is called the incus. And the stirrup, which is uh, called the stape, stapes, stapes. Um, the primary function of this ear area is to transmit that acoustic vibrations from the tympanic membrane. Okay, and then we got the inner ear, which is also called the labyrinth of the ear. And in the in the part of this ear is where it contains that organ of the senses of hearing and equilibrium. Um, so we have the vestibule, we will talk about a little bit more later, um, the semicircular canals and the nerve fibers and the cochlea, which we'll also talk a little bit uh, about later. So that's kind of like a review because it's important to um, have a, 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 like a visual of where um, those uh, chemicals may be affected in the ear. Okay. So let's go in, let's get into this. So what are ototoxicants? So ototoxic, it comes from the we, Greek word auto, A-T-O, uh, which is ear, and then toxic, which means poisonous. So they are chemicals that damage portions of our ears upon exposure, 
specifically the nerve fibers that are responsible for hearing imbalance, okay? And they can reach the inner ear through the bloodstream, and this is very important. This goes through the bloodstream and cause injury to the inner ear and associated new neural uh, pathways. So the signs and symptoms can be from mild tinnitus and hearing loss in one or both ears. At times, the person may have like uh, limited damage or might not, not notice a problem at all. Um, another possible sign for this is that the person has a hard time like hearing high frequency sounds um, well, every, everything else sounds like clear for them. Um, there's no specific test for autotoxicity, at least, at least that's not up to date. And the diagnosis is based on the patient's history and symptoms and also some medical tests. So the tests that can be performed right now are like audiograms or like balance functions related to um, inner ear problems. All right, so let's talk a little about history here. So there, there are two areas um, in terms of like history. The noise that caused that, that medic mechanical damage, and then we have the autotoxicants that's more related to that metabolic stress. So from a mechanical standpoint, um, nose exposures were recognized for centuries, especially you know when that industrialization was kicking in. Um, it wasn't until like the 20th century that tools were made to uh, measure noise exposures. And in that, in that time frame, um, the U.S. military established uh, some guidelines. And, and as we know, in the 1970s, OSHA established the, the standards that we know right now. Uh, from the other side of history, the autotoxicants, um, did not have that name back in the day, okay? However, chemicals and hearing loss studies, are it's not something new. Um, it has been studied again for centuries. And Avicenna, which is a Persian philosopher um, and also a medical scholar, um, it's considered the first person to describe the harmful effect of a chemical substance on ear function. So it is in his most um, influential work from the canon of medicine, which is like from a thousand years ago, um, he warned that the um, mercury vapor was used to combat the head lice um, that could hold that host could make death by the treatment. Okay. And, you know, the decades pass, there were more field studies for mainly in, in Europe by uh, pharmacologists and toxicologists focus on medications and hearing um, impairment. So this, um, this is where the word autotoxicant uh, nomenclature like came into play. So the focus in the 1980s, um, now we're coming back in the uh, close to, to our area, um, was synergistic effects, right? And those studies were primarily primarily in uh, pharmacology. So there's a lot of information right now um, in that area, in, in the medication and the dose response of medications and all that, but not so much in the chemicals um, used in the industries. So it's currently um, a work in progress. Okay. So this is a new perspective of hearing loss, okay? So this is very fascinating uh, from a scientific standpoint because um, it's the synergist between a physical agent and then a chemical agent, and the sum of them increase that hearing loss, okay? I know, I know the outcome of hearing loss is, is bad and affect individuals, but understanding how these two agents interact will help us address the issue and prevent, you know, the hearing loss. All right, let's talk about some toxicology here. Here we're, we're integrating all of the uh, different sciences. You know, we talk about bio biology, now we're gonna talk about toxicology. So there are three um, common interactions um, between noise and autotoxicants. So these are based on animal um, and, and epidemiological studies. 
Um, I will explain the synergism, the addition, and the potentiation interactions in the next slides. So let's talk about um, the synergistic effect first. Um, is the interaction of two or more agents when their combined effects is greater than the sum of the effects seen when each agent is giving a loan. I know it's a lot of words here, but um, you have here, for example, you have noise, which, and then you have the autotoxicant exposure, and then those two enhance the loss of the outer cells which increases that hearing loss. So hearing loss can even um, be greater to both autotoxicants and high exposures are and combined, okay? Um, OSHA standards require employers to maintain exposure, uh, to maintain exposure to the specific substance, you know, um, below the, those permissible exposure limits or PELs, however, um, synergistic effects from the combined autotoxicants and noise exposures could result in hearing loss even when exposures are below the PELs, okay? So that's, that's synergistic effects. And some examples of them, these are the chemicals. Um, for example, styrene. Um, as you know, styrene can be used uh, in the manufacture of plastics, rubber articles, glass fibers, synthetic rubber, and many other applications. So styrene disrupts the cochlear cells um, starting from the middle um, ear leading to hearing loss in the mid-frequency region, okay? So that's styrene. The other one is uh, trichloroethylene or TCE. Uh, which is used like in cleaning and degreasing agents and a means of like extraction. Um, some of the in vivo studies um, suggest that in the inhalation exposure to high concentrations of TCE um, have shown to damage the hearing again in the mid frequency range in rats. Okay. Last but not least for synergistic examples is uh, toluene. Uh, which is widely used as uh, solvents for paints, lacquers, resins, etc. So according to NIOSH, um, they, they have some studies about this. So the apparent interaction between toluene and noise suggests that this type of hearing loss involves the central auditory pathway, okay? So these are three chemicals um, that um, have synergistic effects, okay? The next one is the uh, additive effect. So how does that work? It's pretty much um, occurs when the effect of both participants is equal to the sum of the individual effects, right? Um, so the most studied combination for this is noise and solvents. Um, how this works is when autotoxicants enter the bloodstream and are circulated to the ear where um, they, they damage the sensory cells of that inner ear um, using hearing and balance, okay? So, so noise um, elevates the blood flow in the inner ear, which in turn adds a vehicle for chemicals to enter the inner ear. So that's where the additive effect comes into play. So these are examples of um, some chemicals that have that additive interaction. So we have ethyl benzene, uh, which is um, the solvent is used um, in mixtures for paints and, and lacquers. It is also used in rubber um, and chemical manufacturing industries. So this type of solvent um, reduces the protective role played by the middle ear acoustic reflex and so it's an involuntary contraction um, that normally occurs like in response to high sensitive um, sound stimuli. So a disturbance of this reflex will allow the penetration of a hazardous higher acoustic energy um, into the inner ear, okay? And then we have a metal here, heavy metal, um, which is lead. 
And as you know, it's it's used for lead acid batteries, uh, ship breaking, manufacture of paint. Also, like it could emerge from um, car radiator repair, welding, plumbing, etc. So studies suggest that lead exposure results in the degeneration of the inner ear receptor cells okay and decreases the conduction function of auditory nerve cells okay so those are um examples of the additive effect potentiation so potentiation means enhance so the effect of um increasing that potency um of hearing loss so potentiation, it's a, a subdivision of a synergism in which only one agent um, is effective individually. So it means that increasing um, the, that, the potency and that synergistic action of two exposure agents uh, produces an effect that is greater than the sum of the effect of the chemical use alone. Okay, in other words, um, potentiation, um, you can think about enhance, um, heightening, and raise. So you may ask, like, what is the, the difference um, between synergism and potentiation? Well, um, although potentiation is a subcategory of synergism, as I said, as I said um, synergism is uh, when the combined effect of noise and chemicals is greater than the sum of their effects when given separately. And then potentiation is when the chemical, which is the autotoxicant, enhances that response of the noise exposure. Um, I know it may sound a little bit confusing, but think about poten potentiation as like enhance, okay? So some examples uh, for potentiation um, are systematic affections. And these are um, like carbon monoxide, hydrogen cyanide, acryl nitrile. Um, the potentiation um, of these ones uh, may be due to the reduction of cells ability to repair um, noise induced damage by these gases, okay? And these interfere with oxygen transport or with the intracellular utilization of uh, oxygen, okay? So therefore, um, these type of gases impedes the cell to repair that noise-induced damage, which causes an increase in hearing loss, okay? It's very fascinating. Um, so here, if you like um, bar graphs and, you know, be more visual, um, this chart um, are from the combined exposures to noise and autotoxic substances. It's a document um, from the um, European Agency for Safety and Health at Work, um, which is um, the actual document is called Combined Exposures to Noise and Autotoxic Substances. Um, this, which presents these interactions, and, and I like, I really like this um, this slide here because. It's a great representation of it. So the orange is um, the control group, which is the unexposed. We have the green or A, which is noise, and then the purple or B, which is the autotoxicant. So for the additive effect on the top left here is the sum of the overexposures to bo both noise and the autotoxicant. So this one is very, very straightforward here, okay? Then we have the synergistic effect. Um, we see that even though the noise is lower than the, um, you know, the occupational exposure limit, or OEL, um, when there is an overexposure to the autotoxicant, the potential for hearing loss increases. So here's A and B. And then last but not least, the potentiation effect, since it is, as I said, a subcategory of the synergistic effect, it's somewhat, um, uh, you know, somewhat similar, but the difference is for the potentiation effect in which one agent is 
effective individually, okay? So let's let's put this um, the asphyxians that I mentioned here. So we already know that the systematic asphyxians um, interfere with that oxygen transport, okay? Um, and also with the intracellular utilization of oxygen, okay? Because of this, they impede the cells to repair that noise-induced damage. Therefore, it enhances hear loss. As I said before, I know this is, potentiation is kind of like difficult to, to see, um, but as a reminder, you know, uh, keywords such as enhancing um, hearing loss by their presence, okay? All right, so let's keep going here. All right, we're gonna um, switch gears. We're gonna talk about um, getting into more of what, how those um, autotoxicants come in, in the body. So autotoxicants uh, are like any, any other chemical agent, okay? It may enter the body by inhalation, um, like ingestion and, and this also dermal and it eventually fight its way into the bloodstream. So um, it may eat, then damage the inner ear um, by either affecting the structures in the ear itself or by affecting the nervous system, okay? So after talking about the interactions of autotoxicants with noise, now we're gonna talk switch gears a little bit here and talk about the types of autotoxicants. Um, these affect a specific part of our ears. So that's why I provided that biology 101 in the beginning. Um, and also I will I will spend some time in this slide, so please bear with me. <laughs> um, so we have um, neurotoxicants, we have cochleotoxicants, and we have vestibulotoxicants. And yes, I practiced this. <laughs> um, the first ones are neurotoxicants. So neurotoxicity occurs when exposure to natural or man-made toxic substances, in this case, autotoxicants, or neurotoxicants, I should say, alters the normal activity um, of the nervous system. So this can eventually disrupt or even kill the neurons. Those are the key cells that trans transmit and process like the signals in the brain uh, and other parts of the nervous system. So those autotoxicants that are considered neurotoxicants can inflict um, auditory damage via the central and peripheral nervous systems, okay? So neurotoxicants are autotoxic when they damage those nerve fibers um, that interfere with that hearing imbalance. Examples of these are toluene, which I explained before, that has that synergistic interaction. Um, therefore, this, this um, solvent, toluene, when entering the body through the bloodstream, um, go to that those nerve um, fibers, okay? So that's an example. Another one is the lead. Um, this metal, as we know, can do so many things in our body, right? But from a autotoxicity standpoint, um, as mentioned previously, it is that additive interaction uh, with noise. Um, therefore, um, its target is to degenerate the inner ear receptor cells to decrease the, the conduction uh, function of the auditory nerve cells, okay? Um, so those are neurotoxicants. So next one are cochleotoxicants. And the word, you know, cochleotoxicants, cochlea, right? So these affect the different cochlear structures, um, including those like auditory sensory cells, or in other words, hair cells, um, the, that fluid um, producing cell layer on the outer wall of the cochlear duct. Um, and the spiral ganglion cells, okay? In most cases, um, those cochlear health, uh, hair cells are the primary targets of the cochleotoxicants. Um, so in simpler words, um, these mainly affect the cochlear hair cells, which are the hearing sensory receptors, okay? Um, examples of these 
or carbon monoxide, hydrogen cyanide, um, those gases that I explained that have that potentiation interaction. Um, <clears throat> their target, as I said before, <clears throat> excuse me, is this deprived oxygen within the cochlea, um, which causes an impairment of the cochlear function under extreme exposure conditions, but has those uh, reversible, uh, reversible auditory effects when exposure levels are low. This is where that potentiation um, come into play. Um, the last group um, is the vestibulotoxicants. Um, these affect the balance sensors in the ear um, and result in imbalance. Um, this may accompany by uh, dissonance and vertigo. So we do have a vestibular system and the vestibular system, which compose, uh, is com um, included all these parts here, is part of our uh, balance. Okay, and this is where those autotoxicants that are classified as vestibulotoxicants, they go there. Okay, um, for example, styrene is a, you know, an example of a vestibulotoxicant um, that, as I mentioned previously, has that synergistic interaction. I ho hope you remember that uh, they have a, like, styrene has a synergistic interaction because you were paying attention. Um, <laughs> For styrene, um, according to studies in rats, um, it may cause um, elevation of the auditory threshold and al alter the postural performances and vestibular uh, reflexes, okay? So that's kind of like that synergistic effect that I explained before. Um, these vestibular toxicants are very, very, very hard to identify, study, and treat. And because we're talking about chemicals that includes medications um, that cause problems in our balance, right? So many, many pharmaceuticals are within this category. So speaking about that, um, so these are the different um, chemicals that are considered ototoxic. So, but this is a very, very, very condensed list. Okay, you may notice um, many of these chemicals uh, that were already mentioned um, in the previous slides um, when discussing those uh, toxicological interactions with noise. I will point out uh, from this list the differences between pharmaceuticals and the rest of these um, chemicals here. The pharmaceuticals that you see um, here uh, not only include um, those from an industrial manufacturing standpoint, um, but also from a consumer standpoint. So I will mention uh, some important points about these um, pharmaceuticals. So as you see here, um, certain medic medications that you see here, these are not the trade names, it's just the type of them, um, can damage the ear, resulting in hearing loss, uh, so then we got the tinnitus, balance disorders, etc. So this uh, type of drugs that you see here are considered ototoxic. Remember that I told you that there's a lot of informa information about this. Yes, there are very a lot of studies about all these types of pharmaceuticals. So there are more than 200 known ototoxin medications, um, which includes prescriptive and over the counter as marketed today. So usually the first sign of autotoxicity is that tinnitus again. Um, and over time, um, you may also develop hearing loss. Um, this hearing loss may go, may go un unnoticed until your ability to understand speech is affected. So other um, medications can cause damage to the sensory cells that are used in the hearing imbalance. Um, these uh, sensory um, cells are in the inner ear. Um, many employees uh, will need medications for a condition, an illness, that type of stuff. Um, but if it's taken like in the long term and the medication is considered an autotoxicant, there is a very high potential 
that the person may have some type of damage um, to the hearing. This is a, a challenging part here because when there are laws um, related to the medical status of people, in this case, employees, um, like the HEPA and others, like we cannot ask employees about their possible conditions and one, what medications they're taking, right? So we have to refer the employee to the physician for further treatment. Um, and then after investigating all the possible ways of threshold shifts amongst workers and nothing in the work area is considered a, a red flag, that may be because that employee is taking a medication that is considered an autotoxicant. Okay, so let's talk about another autotoxicant here. Um, yes, tobacco smoke, according to studies, like the ones from the audiology hearing health located in Tennessee, um, says that cigarettes contain autotoxic chemicals. Um, smokers have 70% 70, 70 greater chance of developing hearing loss, okay? Non-smokers are twice as likely to develop hearing loss if they live with a smoker. The greater your daily average of cigarettes, the greater your risk of developing hearing loss. If you work around high levels of occupational noise, right, smoking increases um, your risk of noise-induced hearing loss. Um, what areas of your body are affected by this? So we have the eustachian tube, um, which is the tube that runs from your middle ear and then to the back of your throat. Um, e it equalizes the pressure um, in your ears <clears throat> and it drains that mucus uh, created by the lining of your middle ear. So smoking leads to problems and even blockages in that tube, um, causing pressure buildup and hearing loss, okay? So then we have the blood pressure. So smoking impacts your blood pressure, believe it or not. You may be asking, how does how that have to do with hearing? Well, the structure in your inner ear depend on good, sturdy blood flow, right? When your um, blood pressure changes, your inner ear has difficulty processing that sound. Uh, for example, in pregnant women, smoking restricts that blood flow um, and therefore the oxygen supply to the fetus, okay? So the developing inner ear doesn't get that enough oxygen, so it develops more slowly and can lead to speech language problems later. So that's why women, pregnant women, should not smoke. Um, the other one is the neurotransmitters. So these are the messengers that carry information between the cells in your body. So nicotine interferes with how your body regulates a key neurotransmitter, right? That one that is crucial for transporting sound information from your inner ear to your brain, believe it or not. So this means your brain isn't getting enough sound input so it's harder um, in time making sense of the sounds you hear. And then last but not least, um, it's the central nervous system. So the parts of your ear, uh, I'm sorry, the parts of your central nervous system that creates your ability to hear are still developing in the late adolescence, right? So this system is easily damaged by toxins, um, including autotoxicants and any other chemical. Um, in this case, nicotine, so during its development, which could explain that prevalence among adolescents of hearing loss due to secondhand smoke. So, you may be asking, like, what about e-cigarettes, right? Um, there is insufficient data that proves whether e-cigarettes and its components may cause hearing loss. However, that doesn't mean it can be an autotoxicant. 
So according to studies, um, the use of nicotine is commonly associated with an increase in tinnitus. Um, so e-cigarettes could worsen the condition in nearly like 50 million Americans who experience it. Um, so this is a great example of the synergistic effect because I don't know if you're familiar with e-cigarettes, but you can like um, oh, arrange the uh, nicotine levels. Um, so it depends on how high or low you put those nicotine levels. Um, that, that could be, you know, a, a red flag for, for hearing loss. Okay, so now that um, we understand what are orotoxicants, the interactions with noise, and different types, now let's, um, let's put all this into perspective uh, for occupational hygiene or industrial hygiene. So what should we do to handle these type of um, chemicals, okay? So autotoxicants, as mentioned before, they're chemicals that enter your body to the different routes of exposure, right? Inhalation, dermal ingestion, etc. So these are handled the same way as any other chemical in the workplace. Okay. In the upcoming slides, you will see how the anticipation, recognition, evaluation, and control applies to autotoxicant. Let's start with uh, anticipation. Like which industries are more likely to have autotoxicants? So there is a variety of industries, right? Um, this is just like a snapshot of those industries. Um, from machinery to construction, like there's a lot of industries that handle these type of chemicals. Um, there's also like um, occupational activities um, that often have like high noise exposures and could add synergistic effects when combined to um, those autotoxicants, such as like painting, pesticide spraying, um, amongst others. So let's talk about the recognition here. Um, just being familiar with the chemicals that are being used in the workplace. Um, as industrial hygienists, um, we, you know, search the characteristics of the agents that we need to evaluate, their respective OELs, all that good stuff. So during that research, um, we need to verify which of those contaminants have a designation, right? I don't know, like, for example, sensitizers, et cetera, irritants, et cetera, including autotoxicants. So the, how you can find that? So there are some resources um, where you can um, identify if that chemical is uh, an autotoxicant or not. So the first one are the safety data sheets, the SDSs. So if you go to section 11, um, toxicological information, um, it may tell you whether or not that chemical is an autotoxicant. Um, you may not see the actual word like autotoxicant. However, um, you may see some keywords um, that may tell you that there's a big chance that that chemical is an autotoxicant. For example, if you see the word neurotoxicant, because remember, that's one of those types of autotoxicants that I mentioned before. Um, also, if you see like central nervous system, so those, um, those type of um, um, chemicals or those type of keywords, I should say, um, it may lead you um, to that, um, you know, that autotoxicant uh, classification. The American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists um, has, has allocated a designation uh, for those contaminants that have been identified as ototoxicant. Um, this notation um, is OTO, O-T-O. So I'm going to quote ACGIH here. They define OTO as those chemicals that can cause hearing impairment alone or in combination with noise even below 85 dBA. This notation is reserved for chemicals that have been shown through studies from animals or humans to adversely affect the anatomical structure or auditory function manifested as a permanent audiometric threshold shift and our difficulties in processing sound. So you, you can find this definition in their latest um, booklet. Um, so yes, I'm just quoting their definition here. 
So you can find when you look at the booklet on those adopted values, um, for example, here, ethyl benzene, the notations, um, you will see that OTO, that OTO. So ethyl benzene, uh, according to studies from animals and humans, um, it's, it's an ototoxicant. Okay. I just want to point something out for the third bullet that you see here on the screen. Um, at times, um, we have employees um, that have certain hobbies that may involve chemicals designated as ototoxicants. Okay. Um, this may not be an issue at first glance. However, it may be relevant when all the data collected doesn't fit with the hearing loss of the employee. Like, for example, if you have an employee who's an artist, like here when you see in this picture, you know, um, it oil painting, when you have to handle a lot of solvents. So, it depends on the solvent that that employee is handling. You know what I mean? Like, it could be a contributor of um, the, that, you know, that potential hearing loss. Of course, there's a lot of variables into play. So this is one that you have to like keep in mind in case nothing else makes sense. Okay. So let's go to IH monitoring, uh, which is evaluation, right? So we we perform um, air monitoring and noise surveys, you know, for to just to see um, what's the the exposure, the concentrations in the workplace, for uh, to handle noise and ototoxicants. It's highly, highly beneficial if you do them at the same time uh, because it will provide you um, a better scenario of those potential overexposures with noise and or the chemical. Okay. All right. We go to control after, you know, we collected all the data, we identified um, all the chemicals and see if we have overexposure or not. If we have overexposures, then we apply this hierarchy of controls. Um, this applies to any chemical, or, you know, sensitizer, or toxicants, everything. Um, so starting with that elimination and uh, substitution, um, or like for example, eliminating changing tasks that can cause noise or that autotoxicant exposure, you know, uh, pu putting uh, engineering controls, noise barriers, um, local exhaust ventilation, um, any change in the work and the way people work. And then we ended up with, you know, personal protective equipment if they need um, hearing protection, if they need respiratory protection. You know, it's just you handle it uh, uh, the same as the other um, chemicals um, out there. Okay, this is the most important slide in this presentation. So many of you may be asking, um, should I include the employees who has a hearing loss but the occupational exposures, um, occupational noise exposures are below the occupational exposure level levels in the hearing conservation program. Okay, that's a big question. So I can tell you that OSHA doesn't have a statement in their um, noise standard that mandates or recommends including those um, employees in the hearing conservation program. There, there's no wording if you look at their standard. Um, however, ACGIH um, recommends that affected employees may need to be enrolled in the hearing conservation and medical surveillance programs just to more closely monitor auditory capacity, even when the exposures are below the applicable exposure limits. So also, um, ACGIH recommends periodic audiograms in settings with combined exposures to noise um, and like those those uh, chemicals that I mentioned before, like carbon monoxide, hydrogen cyanide, um, lead, and some solvents, um, and recommends audiograms um, when ethyl benzene, styrene, toluene, again, those examples that I mentioned before, um, can occur um, in the absence of noise. Also, um, for employees exposed to 50% of the noise OELs or also, um, also exposed to 20% uh, or more of those contaminants TLVs, okay, those that has that OTO, that auto designation, um, as well as those employees where dermal exposures um, 
to that autotoxicant is not controlled. The employer should develop an awareness program um, regarding autotoxicants, which including um, those identified in the medical field, you know, the pharmacology, the medications, and others, th those involved in the non-occupational activities. Um, this will be beneficial. And it's not like, it has to be like an awareness for those type of things. Um, you don't have to be like asking them and, and be specific about it, but they, they should have an idea of, you know, what, what are autotoxicants and um, it's not only in the workplace, but also in the different areas where you can see them. Um, so if you put that together, um, communication is important so everybody could be cognizant um, about it. All right, so while autotoxicants can be challenging, um, at least us, the OHS professionals, are able to put a name to that missing link um, between noise and chemical um, overexposures. Um, we need to be, again, aware, cognizant of the variables that contribute to the employee hearing loss, um, especially um, autotoxicants. Um, I know future investigation is needed to identify that dose response relationship um, between noise and chemical exposures just to better um, characterize the cause and effect of um, autotoxicants and establish like more quantitative standards um, to minimize potential exposures and most importantly protect the employee employees hearing in the workplace right that's 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 our goal so what's the future like how how i see the future of autotoxicants well uh, from my perspective um we need more studies um especially that those um response um data between noise and autotoxicants like as of today that i'm aware of we don't have that okay the employee um, is exposed to x ppm for x chemical and x dba for noise all right this could be bad or, or good or whatever we don't have we don't have that yet um and then if we if we create more data um strong scientific data of course um then osha and niosh and acgih and all those entities can implement you know occupational exposure either standards or guidelines just for for us you know it will be helpful for us to better assist that combination between autotoxicants and and noise and then um, after implementing those guidelines or, or regulations, um, us OHS professionals can better assist with the implementation of like engineering controls and also provide training to the employer as well as the employees. We're almost done everybody. So I just wanna uh, share with you the references that I used uh, to explain these um, autotoxicants in the workplace. You may find here many, many good information, you know, uh, technical papers, documents, articles from the AIHA, the synergists we have. There, there's two um, that you may uh, refer to. OSHA and NIOSH has also um, good information about it. And you will see here on the links, um, those are papers um, that explains some of those relationships that I explained um, to you in this um, webinar. All right, I just want to thank everybody for your attention. Um, I hope you like um, this presentation. I also want to thank um, the AIHA and the Synergist for this opportunity. So this is my contact information if you want to reach out just to hey, say hello <laughs> or um, ask any questions. Um, so I'm I'm done. Do we have um, Questions right now? Thank you, Liz Matt. Uh, yep, we do have some questions. Uh, so it looks like we have 10 or 11 minutes left for questions. Just a reminder if you'd like to ask a question, please type it in the chat window on the right side of your screen and send to everyone. Uh, Liz Matt, the first question I have comes from Beverly who asks Do you know if smoking marijuana has the same effect as tobacco smoke? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I don't have the data uh, with me, um, but I can touch base with her. That's a great question. 
Okay, great. Uh, the next question I have um, is about the lead metal neurotoxicity. Um, the question is, is it from exposure to air or from accidental ingestion? It's from overexposure. Like if you're, if you're exposed to, to, to lead and as I said before, it could be from any route of exposure. So it for lead, for example, um, if we keep those controls together, uh, we can avoid inhalation, dermal exposure. I don't know if I answered the question. Uh, I hope so. Um, we'll be sharing all, all these questions with SKC um, after the event too. So just in case um, you know any further clarification is needed. Um, they should be able to reach out. Okay. Um, so the next question I have is, um, how can you tell the difference between an ototoxicant chemical health effects and occupational noise exposure? Uh, hmm, can you repeat the question? I don't know exactly what. Sure. Can you repeat the question? Um, yep, the question's from Luis. Um, and I'll keep an eye on the chat if there's any clarification that comes through. Um, the question is, how can you tell the difference between an ototoxicant chemical health effect and an occupational noise exposure? Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, that's a great question. Um, the differences will, will be depending on um, the type of chemical that, that it is. Um, if it's a... If it's a, an autotoxic in and with noise, um, that's not my, how I say this? Um, <laughs> the difference, um, it depends on the, on the data and yes, they have a lot of similarities. Um, you may have like, uh, the tinnitus and, uh, the, um, you know, the, the balance issue and whatnot. So it depends on the what where that chemical will go if it's a, a neurotoxicant if it's a vestibular toxicant if it's a cochlear toxicant um so the for example if it's a vestibular toxicant um in addition to the tinnitus then that person will have like you know balance issues or vertigo so um it's 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 not it's it's not like a black and white situation um that's a big another big challenge too um, so uh, it depends on, on the type of autotoxicant that, um, you're dealing with, if that makes sense. Okay, great. Thank you. The next question I have is, is the hearing loss reversible if the exposure is eliminated? Um, yeah, depends on, um, I know I mentioned, uh, a little, a uh, little bit of the uh, interactions. Uh, between noise and autotoxicants. So the probability, um, there's a probability that yes, it could be reversible. Of course, there's some variables into play, um, but but yes, it could be, it could be re reversible under certain circumstances. Okay, thanks. The next question I have is, um, is there a condensed list of known autotoxicants available? I'm sorry, say that again. Uh, someone's asking if there is a condensed list of known autotoxicants available. Um, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll have to get back to that person um, with, with the question. Okay, that sounds good. Um, the next question I have, we have plenty of questions. <laughs> is, um, good, good. <laughs> what airborne concentration of CO increases the risk of hearing loss with no significant noise exposure? That's a question. Uh, that's that's what I was mentioning at the end. Like, unfortunately, at this time, um, we don't have enough data that uh, could tell you that exact question um, about that dose response relationship. You know, that CO concentration and then the noise. That's something that, you know, we need to get more data so that those entities, um, you know, ACGIH, OSHA, NIH, et cetera, can put that list together for us. That's, that's the biggest challenge for autotoxicants right now. Okay, great. Uh, the next question I have is, why does the hearing conservation program put major effort on dermal auto exposures? Oh, well, um, because, uh, dermal is also a, a route of exposure. 
So remember that um, autotoxicants um, go through the bloodstream. So if that autotoxicant, you know, if you're exposed thermally to that autotoxicant, it goes, absorbs the skin, it's metabolized, it will go through the bloodstream to your hearing. So yes, that's why um, they included there because it's part of that route of exposure, um, you know, so it, we have to make sure that all the bases are covered, you know, inhalation, dermal, et cetera. Okay, great. Um, I had another question that I think you just answered. Um, someone asking, you know, so the solvents don't have a skin notation, how important um, is skin exposure a concern? I think you covered that, but in case you wanted mm -hmm. to add anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, I mean, um, uh, if it has a skin, uh, then it's it's like like every every other chemical in terms of route of exposure, right? So, again, autotoxicants, um, like it come it it goes inside the body and then it goes to it affects the the, the inner ear, middle ear, etc. Those especially more the inner ear. Um, so again, if you get uh, exposed dermally, then you go. You know, it goes through your system bloodstream and into your inner ear. Okay, got it. Uh, the next question is, will the audiogram for ototoxicant-induced hearing loss look similar to one for noise-induced hearing loss? That's a good question. Um, I'm not an audiogram technician. Um, that will be a question for, a, you know, a nurse or an occupational doctor. Um, but I can I can take a look to see if I can find some information. Okay, got it. Uh, the next question I have comes from Jeremy, who asks, "Are the chemical OEL um, maybe are the chemical OELs generally considered protective against the autotoxic effects?" Um, well, the OELs. Um, I, I know there's a document through OSHA or NIOSH, I think, um, they're pretty, like, mostly based on inhalation. Um, so the, this is just a different, uh, type of, um, um, I would say perspective. It's mostly on inhalation. So that's, that's what I mean that there's a lot of gaps here for autotoxicants, which, um, ironically it's been studied, but now it's just coming to play, you know, and we need more data to address it. Okay, great. That makes sense. Um, the next question I have comes from Richard, who asks, is there any source where you can get an idea of the exposure concentrations for different chemical agents that would specifically cause an ototoxic effect? Well, um, you know what? I, I haven't seen a list as of yet. I know there's a couple of papers, which some of them are listed in the reference section. That talks about, you know, they, they like uh, do like uh, some studies for uh, noise versus whatever chemical, you know, a solvent or a gas. Um, so some of them are are listed in those references, but we don't, as far as I know, we don't have like a list. I looked. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Um, great. Um, let's see. Um, sorry, just <laughs> keeping an eye on the chat too. Um, unfortunately, I think um, someone's asking about um, questions. Um, just wanted to mention that um, we'll be sharing the chat transcript with SKC, so they should be able to um, get back to people with extra questions if we haven't had a chance to get to them. Um, I think we have time for one last question. I see that came in um, someone asking, are there corresponding um, DBA levels for ototoxin concentration levels? Yeah, so fortunately, um, I think I mentioned this before, but uh, we don't, we need that list. Um, and as far as I know, we only have the designation, that auto designation. Um, and, you know, certain, um, certain references that lead us to, oh, this are classified as ototoxicants, but we don't have like, like a, a list, you know, like, you know, when you go to OSHA table Z1, we don't have that right now. Okay. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Um, as I mentioned, we'll be sharing all questions from today's event with SKC. So if we didn't get to your question, please know that we'll pass it along. 
I wanted to thank Lucinette Alvarado for her presentation, SKC for sponsoring today's webinar and all of our participants. Our next Synergist webinar, Data Stewardship for Chemical Companies, will be held November 16th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Registration is open at aiha.webvent.tv and hope everyone has a great day. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. All right, thank you everyone. This actually concludes today's webcast. Thank you all for attending. The recording will be available at aiha.webvent.tv. We will send all registrants an email tomorrow with that link. And please visit our event calendar to sign up for future webcasts.